Hello, welcome, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome everybody to the final series of uh, Triton's uh, webinar series on DBQ version 11. Uh, I'm joined uh, today by George Beckler from IBM. My name is Iqbal Gorarwala. I'm the head of DB2 mid-range at Triton Consulting. Uh, I'm going to be your co-host. Um, George today is here with us, uh, here with me right now, sitting next to me actually in London. Uh, it's quite sunny here for a change. Welcome, George. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, for those of you who have been following this series, you know this is our uh, fourth and uh, last uh, last sort of uh, session in the in the in the, the four-part webinar series. We started with an overview of DB2.11, and then we went into deep dives into uh, DB2, the blue enhancements in DB2.11, and then we looked at pure scale enhancements last week, and today we'll end the webinar series with SQL enhancements in DB2 version 11. Um, so I'll just pass it on to George now to sort of walk us through. Yeah, we'll see this week to, if we can actually show slides before I start talking. So, uh, see how the technology works today. And hopefully people will be able to see my startup page. So we're going to talk today about SQL enhancements, or SQL for the converted. Um, we're quite proud of the fact that at uh, IBM we reproduce some of the uh, most sophisticated SQL in the world that nobody knows how to use. So uh, <laughs> we're going to try and cover some of the new stuff in version 11 today. Uh, listen, Iqbal, do we have any other uh, follow-ups from last week? Any uh, words that yeah, you wanted to? Sure. I mean, I, I think last week was really, uh, you know, I, 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 I just, you know, I just thought it was fascinating. I mean, after, to be honest with you, after many years, not many years, after a few years, you know, I, I feel that, you know, that the time is so right now for uptake of pure scale okay uh, we saw last week how easy the TCPIP connectivity uh, would make you know make it easier for people to implement pure scale that's one thing second thing uh, we looked at the two node option right where one node is being your workload and the other node is being your you know your, your backups and your reorgs and your, uh, maintenance processes uh, so you have an active active cluster and this is available in your you know standard uh, work group server edition and also Enterprise civilization. So, you know, you start using your skill, and especially if, you're in, if, you're, if your requirement is high availability, the time hasn't been better. So, I, you, know, I, you know, I was pretty, you know, I'm going to go all out now to my customers and really tell people, you know, start trying it, look at it, and of course, when scalability becomes an issue, uh, performance is a need, then, you know, they can, we can start, you know, increasing the cluster size and, 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 and all that stuff. Yeah, and, uh, and I really like the new features in PureScale. And uh, so now we're going to do is talk a little bit about um, SQL. And, sure. um, you know, there's been a major amount of features put into this release. Uh, you know, you'll notice in a minute that a lot of these features are uh, directed at what I call compatibility. And uh, there's a reason for that. We think that um, a lot of people are coming from different types of servers and databases, and including our own, and the more compatible we can make it, the easier it'll be for people to uh, move over to DB2. So now before we get started, a couple of little things. We're going to talk about syntax conventions because a lot of the slides that I have, you know, talk about how does this function work, and I just want to explain the syntax and the arguments because it, I'll do that once instead of having to reiterate on every slide. Okay. Um, then we're going to talk about some new data types. So there are actually new data types in this release that you'll be able to use. Uh, plenty of date time functions, good for people who want to do queries based on, you know, give me the data by quarter, by day, by week, by, you know, those types of analysis. Yeah. Um, regular expressions, you're going to hate and love regular expressions at the same time. A um, bunch of new stats, statistical functions, a uh, little bit of miscellaneous SQL, and then NetTeza compatibility. So if anybody out there who's been using NetTeza, you'd be happy to know that there, there's some new um, compatibility features in here that'll make it easier to move your SQL over and run it on uh, DB2. Okay, so syntax conventions. Um, so, uh, like I said, a lot of these functions use the same kind of syntax, and so I want to just explain how the arguments are referred to in, in my um, SQL diagrams. Okay, so basically when you see the screen come up with a function definition, we'll say the return code, in this case big integer, is equal to function name, 
and then the arguments. And within the arguments, you'll see expression and algorithm, or there may be expression, expression, or whatever. When we say expression, there's always a primary expression type. So uh, think, for instance, a square root function. Right? You expect it to have a number. right? So that'll say what the base data type should be, so decimal or number or something. Um, the way DB2 works these days is we could take other types of arguments. So we could take a character argument, for instance, and we'll try to convert it for you. So when it says numeric, it can be a number, it could be a character string, and what we'll try and do is, is coerce the character string into a number for you. So there's a possibility you'll get an error if your character string doesn't include a number in it. So, you know, but the base expression will always say it's an integer or a number, but it could be other arguments. Another example is date and time. Right, because that could be a character string. Sometimes it could be a number, whatever. But just, but just realize, DB2 is going to try and cast these values into the primary data type that the function needs. Okay, so that's true for any of these slides. So the next page just shows you an example, like square root of four. Yeah, we figured that out. Square root of quote four quote that works too, right? Because we can convert it to a number. Um, by the way, we see this a lot in web applications because right? we changed the behavior of DB2 a number of releases ago because when you see web apps, they tend to be all character string based, right? Where people will say, you know, age is less than quote 24, quote. And DB2 used to get really upset with that and say, well, you can't use a character string when you're comparing it to a number. But now we use something called weak typing and say, we're going to try and translate it for you. Only thing you have to be careful of is sometimes the conversion isn't exactly what you expect. Okay, so take a look at the date function. Date 2016, you think, oh, that's going to give me a timestamp for the first day of 2016, right? Uh, no, it gives you the year one, the 2016th day from the beginning of time, right? right. <laughs> so yeah. that's what that does. Yeah. So sometimes you've got to be careful. But you'll see a quoted string, like quote 2016 0101, comes back with the proper timestamp. Yeah. Um, you know, usually string parameters, they don't care. String parameters will will you know, take a number and convert it into a string, right? That's usually okay. The only time you'll get an error with character functions is if you have a, um, too many characters or I can't convert something to a number, okay? So for all the functions now you see for the rest of this presentation, this is how things work, right? Okay. Okay. No, that's good. Okay, so to some new data types. Believe it or not, we, did, we added some new data types in DB2. The first one is, <laughs> is binary, okay? Everybody needs a binary data type. Um, Actually, we could do this before, right? You could use blobs or you could use um, a char for bit only data, right? That was what we called a character string that had binary stuff in it. Um, but binary is the typical one the industry uses, right, for, for binary data. So now you can have a binary 255 bytes of data or a var binary up to 32K. Anything bigger than that, you're going to have to use a long, like a blob, okay? And by the way, these are compatible. So binary, var binary, and 4-bit data and blobs are all compatible. Now here's a big one. We change character from 254 bytes to 255. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure this took a massive amount of investment on our part to, to test that extra byte. Um, but uh, this is for compatibility. I, I don't understand why we had 254 to begin with, but yeah. it's now 255. Okay? Uh, and believe it or not, you may have to look at some of your code because um, there's a char function, right? Char function will convert something into a character string, right? It's a character string. Before, if you had something that was 255 bytes long and you did a char function, you would, it would actually come back as a var car because it was too big, right? Now it'll come back as a, as a car, as a 255 fixed length. Um, so the behavior changes slightly. I'm not sure there's going to be many programs out there that have that issue, right? Yeah. But just something you, people be need to be aware of. Okay? Okay. Also lots of synonyms for data types. So these are um, data types that are used by other systems like MySQL or Postgres or Matiza. So int2 is a, is a synonym for small int, int4 for integer, int8 for big int, float4 for real, float8 for float. And you know, so it's just different, okay? I mean, you could just use these names instead of small int, for instance. So no big deal, right? Yeah. But again, it, it means if you're moving some, from some other system, you don't have to go and change all your n2s into small n's, right? Yeah. Uh, one thing to note, though, if you're using the describe command in db2, you know it tells you the structure yeah. of your table. Yeah. The describe will always come back with the db2 data type. So n4 will come back as an integer. It won't right. come back as n4. People just need to realize that the names that come back are only the, always the db2 names. Okay. okay. 
What about um, when you do something with uh, DB2 look and those kind of things? Yeah, same thing. DB2 look will always show you the native data type, right? Or the native, for instance, if people are using CLI or ODBC, there's there's certain uh, codes associated with those data types. There's a what we call an ODBC um, type number, right? right? So the type numbers will remain the same. All right, new, new, there are no new type numbers for these different data types. Okay. okay. So, but binary, for instance, will have a new type number. So if anybody's written anything to do with low-level CLI, they'll have to recompile with the new CLI library to get the right um, ODBC and CLI type codes, okay? Um, function synonyms, again, these are just function names that you may be using in one of these other products, and the name is different than what DBT does, so basically we will support all of these names as synonyms. Okay? And you can see the list there. Um, like, for instance, on um, the TISA, you might have distribute on, right, whereas we use distribute by. And DB2. So just a slightly different syntax. Okay. So far we haven't done a lot, have we? You know, it's just basically synonyms, right? <laughs> okay, okay, but uh, it, gets it gets better, better folks. Okay, so hang on the line. You'll see some neat <laughs> stuff in a minute, right? This one, I like this. This, this is create table. table. So you probably see no big deal. I can create a table today by doing a like, right? Yes. So I say create table like and another table. The difference here is we're using something called the create table as, and the as allows me to specify a select statement, which generates, generates the definition of the table. So the sample database has an employee table. The first statement here says create employee emp as select asterisk from employee, which basically means take this, the structure, the DBL for employee, and you know I'm going to create the same table called EMP with the same structure. Now the little keyword at the end with the data is really neat. That means I'm now going to populate that table I just created with the data out of that select statement. Okay. Now, a couple things. One is well, one, one statement, statement I create and populate, but the populate is an insert into. Okay, that's okay, awesome. so I'm just going to ask yeah, you. Yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, and he said, ah, shit, <laughs> somebody just did a billion row create table, right? Yeah, so you're going to slot them silly and say, don't do that. Now, but the nice thing is the create table syntax allows all of the options that you normally have with a table. So I could say, uh, not logged initially, right? Or I could do other things with it, put it into a different table space, or I could. You know, uh, so so I have options of just creating it with the base stuff. I could say organize by call. Okay. okay. And you could just say create table as you know select, first, you know thousand rows or something. Like Absolutely. That. So okay. the second the second example here is just definition, which means only give me the creation of the table. Yeah. Don't don't populate it. And the last one shows you uh, arbitrary SQL that I'm using here. You can see I'm saying. Get all the employees in the park with D11, but only fetch three rows. Ah, there you go. Yeah, so somebody wants a sample, they may say, well, I only want 10,000 rows. I could say, you know, select from the table, fetch first 10,000 rows only. And, and that's how you can do some quick load and test it. So it's a nice, quick, quick short form for creating tables. Well, that's good. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's, it's like kind of creating views, actually, but uh, these are really proper, you know, permanent materialized tables. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I like this one. It's actually rare that they actually create something that I, I liked, okay? Um, here's another one, and, and I'm gonna ask the audience to think about this one, because this is offset with fetch first. So fetch first says, I only get, wanna get so many rows on the answer set, okay? So it's great for prototyping, or if you just really need the first 100 rows. What offset does is says, I'm gonna fetch those rows, but I want you to start actually getting the rows after so much from the beginning. Okay, so here, for example, the example says, Select ask for employee, offset 10 rows, fetch first five. So that means I want you to go 10 rows in before I start fetching five rows. So it's like a window into the answer set, right? And um, so yes, I could use this for prototyping, but the other reason I can see this being used is for what I call scrollable answer sets, where you don't want to keep a cursor open. So an example would be, let's say, a web page, where I display a bunch of products and I show the first 10, right? So what I would do is say, basically, um, you know, Offset zero, or you don't even use offset. Fetch, fetch first ten rows only. Yes. The next time I come in, I could say offset ten, fetch first ten. So I've actually gone ten into the answer set before I fetch the next ten. So I could window through the the uh, data without always having to start at the beginning. Now the downside of this is that the data is changing. Your ten rows that you get may be different than when you started, right? So that's a problem if you're not using a cursor, right? right. Um, but if you do an order by based on some, I don't know product code or something, then you should keep a consistent uh, answer set. Um, so it's really up to you. But that, this allows you to have a longer period of time before the next um, you know, enter key or page down without holding cursors and stuff open in, in the database. Right? 
Now, a lot of you like to write your own functions, so things like you know your own square root function or your own table function. We never let you create your own columnar function. So that's been changed in this release. So I can create a function that um, basically allows me to uh, do aggregation right over my data. So let's say you want to create a new average function. Well, what it'll what it requires is four internal functions. One is called initialize. So basically, when you when the function gets called, it has to set up all its counters and stuff, right? And every time a row comes in, I call your function to do whatever you need to do. You know, do aggregation, summation, whatever it's doing. Then, if you're in a DPF environment, you know you have multiple nodes. Before you finalize the answer, you're going to have to get all the aggregations right from all of those nodes and do the proper sum or whatever you do. And then you do a finalize, which is it the result of your aggregation function. Um, so it's a fairly sophisticated uh, function, but it allows you to create these new column functions that you may want to use. Right? Okay. Um, so it's, it's pretty sophisticated. Right? I don't have any examples yet, because I haven't, I haven't got into the details yet. How to do it. Okay, so that's uh, functions, right? So I mean, new data types, some new kind of neat SQL, right? Now we're going into date and time, and I have to tell you, they've gone mad in this release. With uh, data, data time. time, yeah, I, I guess they figure you know when you're doing warehousing SQL and OLAP, you're always going to do it by some date range, and people always want to dissect the dates based on different intervals. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is something called extract, and extract has the format extract element. So element will be the date. What portion of the date do I want from expression? An expression is a timestamp or a date or a time or a you know something like that. So basically, I would say something like extract the year from today's date, right? So that's kind of how the function works. So here's all the things I can get out of it. Okay, so from a date, I can get things like the, the epoch. That is the time from the start of the Unix or Linux clock, which was 1970. Uh, millennium. So my manager says, the next time you get a raise, George, is in the next millennium, right? So it would be, you know. Soon, <laughs> soon enough. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so you can get, you know, century, decades, years, quarter, right? Kind of interesting. Uh, the other one that's interesting too is week, because there actually can be up to 53 weeks in a year. Yes. Right. So that's used for financial reporting. Um, I know IBM has a 13th month in order to make the numbers look better. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you can get day of the week, right? You can say what day of the week is that? Right. So like one is Sunday, two is Monday, right? Yeah. Uh, you could do things like uh, what day of the year is it? From one to 366. Hours, minutes, seconds, no So you say pretty extensive, right? You can do lots of stuff with the dates. Yeah, and you can see they, they return all sorts. Of, usually as integers, they return. Some of them return decimals because of the size, like seconds, right? The other function we have is date part. So date part is similar to extract, but it's more, it, I guess it looks more like a traditional function. Remember the other one said, give, give me the epoch from a date, right? This one is more like give me the two things as expression, like as arguments to a function, right? So it's, it does the same thing. It's just a different way of writing the function. You can also do truncation of dates. You know, so truncate to the nearest quarter, truncate to the nearest month, truncate to the nearest, right? Um, pretty simple. Uh, some new date and time built-in functions, which is a little bit different. Day of month basically says if you give me a date, I'll tell you what the day of the month is in that date. You say, well, I, that's not that tough. I've got a timestamp. I know which one is the month, right? Or what's the day? It, it's just that it does it in one function call, right? So give me the day of the month that that date is on. Uh, give me the first day. So what it does is it takes your date and gives you the date back with the first of the month. And the last one is days to the end of the month. It tells you how many, pair, how many days are actually until the 31st or 30th or 29th or whatever of the month. So they're very, again, a useful expression, right? Create manipulation. You could have done this before, but it, it required more math, right? Yeah. Um, age is another neat one. Age is what is the difference uh, between today, like now, right, and the number that you put in? Okay, so you're basically saying, what's the, um, for instance, if I said last month, and I said, what's the age of last month? What it does is it gives you a number of years, months, days from last month to today. Okay, and it's in a very different format. Okay, people look at this function, you expect a timestamp, it's not. What it does is it gives you Two digits for the number of days, two digits for the number of months, and two digits for the number of years, or well, actually more. Right? So, for instance, if I had today's date and one month ago, the answer would be 100, because it would say it would be 01, 
could be one month and zero, zero for the number of days. So it's a different format for dates. And it's used for range calculations. It's actually easier to use this type of format than some of the traditional date and time functions. Okay? And we find this being used by other vendors, including us. Okay? So that's why it's here. Right. DB2 people will say, well, what do I need that for? Right? And you may, say, well, you may not need it at all. You could care less, maybe. right? But uh, it's just another function for compatibility. Um, here's another way of doing addition, right? You can add or subtract. So if you give me a negative number, it would be a subtract. But you can add years, months, days, hours, seconds, and minutes to a date, right? So again, fairly simple. You can extract interesting things out of dates. You can say, give me the quarter, the first day of the quarter, right, for this particular date. This week, this year, and this month. Um, so again, a nice way of a simplifying extraction, right, out of dates. Uh, think about it in a query, right? Give me all of the sales for this quarter, right? And all you have to do is give today's date, and it'll figure out what this quarter is, yeah. right? Uh, we can also add. So in terms of give me the next quarter, right? Uh, next year, next month. Again, just an extension of these functions. Next day. But what's, not, what's neat about this one is it'll, it'll, you know, based on the character string you use, figure out what the day is. So for instance, you'll say, okay, I'm going to give today's date. I'm going to say next day, today's date, Monday. Mm -hmm. And what it'll do is it'll give me a timestamp back that tells me what the next Monday is after today. And so I can just say Monday as a character string. Um, so that's really useful because, you know, I may want to know what's the next, the next Tuesday, right? And it'll calculate it for me. And it's also in the national language. So, you know, here we're going to use Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, in France, right? Yeah. You know, Monday, Morty, Macready, whatever, German, right? You know, bone tough, doom stuff, and you know, whatever, Midwalk, whatever it is. Yeah. You know, so whatever your national language is, I can do it in this function. Okay. Um, also between functions. So this is like how many days are between these two dates? How many hours? How many seconds? Right? And these all return integers, except for one. Okay, so I'm gonna keep you in suspense here. You notice is hours, minutes, seconds, days, weeks, years. What's missing? Months. Months, yes. yes. You got it. Okay, all right. Everybody get that one? Months, months. are missing. Um, because months, months doesn't, doesn't return an integer value. value, it returns a fraction. Cool. Why? Okay. Who is the idiot it. who built this? Thing? Something has to be different. Yeah. Okay, so it gives you a fraction, all right? And I, and I the way it was explained to me, and I still think they must have been smoking something, is that you know, months can have a different number of days. Okay, so when you say months, when I say what's what's you know, how many months are there between, you know, uh, say June and August, right? So June is 30 days, July 30, 31, August is 31. Yeah. What is that? How many months are between February and April? So February this year had 29, right? April had 30, 30 right? Yeah. May had 31. Yeah. So you see it's a different number of days between February and April versus the number of days between, right, June and August. And so that's why it uses a fraction system. I don't know why I would do this, okay? I, I, anyway, I, still think, it's three months I, I think it's, I know, I know, but I'm sure it's got something to do with a banker somewhat, because as you know, we can't, we can't have this roundoff error that isn't in our favor, right? So, right. you know, okay. And the now function is like um, current timestamp, okay? It's just a synonym. So I could say, you know, now rather than, now the thing about now is that if you use an expression, timestamp or the now expression. It doesn't matter how many times you use in the SQL, it's the same value. It never changes during the duration of your SQL. So people have to realize that. If you've got a piece of SQL that you know does the now function multiple times, they're all going to have the same value. They're all the same at the start of the execution of that SQL. Right. Right? All, all the yeah, for the whole transaction. Yeah. Yeah. A year, month, day between. Uh, this is another one of those strange functions that takes two timestamps and tells you the number of days, months, and years between them using that special format, you know, with two digits for number of days, two digits for number of months, yeah. two di and then whatever number of digits for years. By the way, that used to be used in the past for sorting. Really? Because, you, yeah, because, you know, you're, okay, wh what am I using? Am I using the ISO standard for year, month, day? Am I using the U.S. standard, right, month, day, year? Or am I doing day, month, year? Am I using the Japanese? You know, the, every date has a different format. So when you use this format, you know that this ordering is always correct, right? Just like ISO ordering is correct. 
but I don't have to use the special characters. So these these can be numbers and placed into big ints or into ints. So they're easier to handle rather than characters. So that's, that's one of the reasons that was used. Now the overlaps is an extension to SQL. Um, overlaps allows you to check two different date intervals. So in this case, you can see there's a 2016, March 17th to 21st. Does it overlap the dates March 20th to 22nd? And the answer is true. Okay, so it's not like a standard function. It's actually using the SQL syntax to uh, determine whether they overlap. So this one's slightly different from all the rest of them. You know, you actually have to change your SQL. I have a quick question here. I mean, is this all compatible with the temporal stuff that was introduced in DBD10? You know, the time, the history, time history yeah. and everything. I mean, you know, very time is obviously modeled as a first class object now and all that stuff. Yes. Um, all these date time extensions apply to that as well? Yeah. So these things can also be used in your temporal calculations. Okay. Um, I guess you get more flexibility now how you specify uh, yes. time intervals. Um, the ones I don't, I don't think will work are like the month day, that special one with the year month days as an integer, right? Doesn't doesn't work with those as far as I'm concerned. They have to use uh, traditional timestamps. Okay. Okay, now this one's a lot of fun, regular expressions. Yeah. And um, this will drive people crazy. They'll either love it or hate it, okay? So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna take you through some examples. So regular expressions basically are a way of matching characters, right? And today, if you're familiar with the SQL syntax, you know we have like. Right? And like basically means, you know, character string followed with any number of values, so it's a percent sign. Yeah. Underscore for a single character, right? Yes. Um, you know, so it's very simplistic. Uh, regular expressions can search for anything, repeated characters, upper, lower case, you know, all sorts of nutty patterns. So I'm going to take you through a quick tour of this stuff. Sure. And there's, and there's seven of these functions. Um, so basically the functions are called with a very simple calling sequence. They're all the same. All right. You give it the string you want to search, the pattern you want to search within the string, any flags associated with how we want to do the search, a start position for it to start in the string, in the string, yeah. and then whether you're using single or double byte characters. Right. And then so the functions are count. How many times did I find the pattern? Extract means uh, return one of those strings that got matched. What actually got matched? Return it. In a string returns the, the actual location it was found, so a number, right? Yeah. Like is says whether it's true or false. Did I find it or not? Match counts is how many times did I right. match it, right? Um, replace is basically, yes, replace the string with the other string. And then substring, okay? Um, so all of these things can use a number of special regu regular expression syntax. So I'm going to go through those. And hopefully people can <laughs> keep up with this stuff, right? So regular expressions allow a variety of special characters to be used to tell me how I want to match. Okay, so I'm going to go through just a few of these because you're all going to fall asleep by the time I'm done, right? <laughs> but but the bar, or you know, the, that means or. I can say A or B. So find character A or character B or string A or string B. The little asterisk means match something zero or more times. So an asterisk dot means find anything, any character. If I said like asterisk one, that means I want to find the number one, zero or one more times, right? Plus means at least one or more times. Right. The question means match zero or one time. Okay? <laughs> uh, and then you can see then it says exactly how many times or at least this many times yeah. or on and on and on, okay? Yeah. So, the, People can read all these, but there are university courses on regular expressions, yeah. right? So we also support, as you can see, extended regular expressions. So we can actually match a pattern and then use the pattern I just matched to do subsequent pattern matching. This gets really crazy, folks. I'm going to show some examples so you see how bad this goes. So nested regular expressions, yeah. right? Yeah, nested regular expressions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we can also have, we have all these meta characters as well for matching all sorts of strange characters in your data. So you can, for instance, you can say you know, match a line feed character, or match a bell, or, or special hex codes, or, you know, unicodes, or whatever. You can also do things like uh, match character sets. So you can say, I want you to match, um, you know, characters that are part of the Greek character set, right? okay. or acrylic, or, you know, uh, it's nuts. As you can see, there's a bunch of strange things. You can also say match the beginning of a character set, match the end of a character set, 
and then you can also have meta characters, right? So you can say match uh, special characters as well. Um, there's also a bunch of flags that you can set within the expression. So one of the flags, the, probably the most important one, is case insensitive. So you can say whatever matching you do, don't worry about case, right? Just uppercase everything. Um, by default, it is fully lower uppercase match. So you can tell the regular expression, ignore case. That's, that's one that people will have to look out for. Okay, and then you can do things like, um, an example would be, I've got a text string in DB2, but the text string itself is made up of multiple lines. And you know those multiple lines will have carriage returns at the end of each line, right? So the regular expression, the way it tends to work is when you say the beginning of a line and the end of the line, it will take whatever the physical thing that you sent it and assume that byte number one is the beginning and byte number, whatever the end is, is the end. Even though there may be multiple lines in there, right? So you may have in inserted it as 10 lines. Each line has a beginning and end using new line character or character return, depending on what system you're on. So you could tell that regular expression to look at this thing as if it was 10 separate lines. So there'd be 10 beginning and 10 end of lines in your block of text, as opposed to the normal, which would have been just the beginning of the, of the data and the end of the data. So that's another flag that people may want to consider looking at, right? And so on, okay? So this, this changes the behavior of a regular expression. So here are some examples. In fact, I'm going to show you some nicer, easier examples. But for instance, the brackets mean anything in this list or any of those. So the first one would mean I want you to match A, B, or C. I don't care, any one of those. Okay, if you do the little, little carrot sign in there, that means not any of those. So I can match anything except A, B, or C. Uh, the next one says match anything between the uppercase letters A through the uppercase letter M. Okay, and then I can do that through Unicode. Or I can say use special, um, special directives. So you'll see like the fifth down, one down says uh, letter. So letter means any printable letter. Um, so anyway, people will have to spend weeks reading all of this stuff, right? <laughs> uh, so let me give you some examples, which are a little probably a little closer to home, right? Sure. So here are all the stations on the central line in London. Okay. Yes, we trust are. me. Trust me, they're on there. Okay. Yes, we are at Chancery Lane. I can see that the. In fact, I'm lucky because the central line today was working, whereas the circle line was not. Neither was the Hammersmith Smith and City, nor was the um, Bakerloo line. <laughs> so I was stuck going to Earl's Court to get my way over to Victoria this morning. But anyways, <laughs> I think every time I come to London, there's a new new line that goes down for me. I think it's we just, keep it interesting. And you do, yes. I'm just glad I know where I'm going, right? Okay, so these are all the regular stations on the uh, central line. So the first example I'm going to show you is say, give me the name of the station on the central line where the station has the letter Q in it. So those brackets mean I want to find Q anywhere, right? That's, yeah. that's basically very simple kind of so you can see Queensway is the only one in the central line with a Q. Okay, I, I wonder if anybody's actually looking through the list. But anyways, trust me. Okay, <laughs> Queensway is the only one. So that's pretty simple. Yeah. Now look at this next one. So a little carrot at the front means Not starting. No, that means starting. That means, starting. That means I want to start with the letter G. Right. So there are more ways to do this. I could have said E, B, C would have been any station with the letter G or B or C. But in this case, I'm going to just say G. Right. Yeah. So you see there's three of them, Greenford, Gans Hill, and Grange Hill. Yeah. Okay, so again, a very simple, but you can see how I'm starting to use this, right, yeah. for, for searching. Now look at this one. This one has the word hill in it and a dollar sign at the end. Now, most people look at that and think, oh, that means you want to find hill at the end, right? Well, surprisingly, there's the answer. Gans Hill, Grange Hill, Chigwell, and, and uh, Buckhurst Hill. Ah. So there's something wrong with this, isn't it? Because the third one is not a hill, is it? Hill anywhere. anywhere. Yeah, no, what hill is, when you do it in those brackets, that means any of those letters. Yeah. I need to match those letters. Mm. And you'll notice H-I-L-L -L is in Chigwell. In, in Chigwell, yes. Okay, but not the way I expected it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Okay, so the proper way to do it was just hill by itself. Okay, mm. and that basically, if you just spell out what you're looking for, so this would be like a like statement, you know, but, but here you're matching the end. Okay, a like statement matches only from the beginning. 
right? There's no way to force a match at the end of a string. Oh, yeah, actually, you can. No, you do the percent yeah. sign and then yeah. hill, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, anyway, so that's how you would do hill. So, let's get a little more sophisticated, okay? Because these are, you know, people don't like the central line. But um, this example says, the little carrot at the front says, start at the beginning, match a character. So, the dot means a character. I don't care what it is, right? The brackets around it mean I want to keep the results of this answer. So I'm going to match one character. I want you to remember it. That's what those brackets mean. Then the dot asterisk means followed by any number of characters. So the dot means a character. The asterisk means zero or one. Right. So I'm going to find the first character. Keep it right in memory. Then I want you to scan. I don't care what the characters are. And then a backslash one refers to the first answer I found. Okay. So the first answer I found is that dot, the first character. That's what that refers to. So that so what this statement says is find all the stations whose first character in the name is also at the end. See the dollar sign means end. Yeah. Okay, so how many stations do you think there are that have names where the first letter also is the last letter of the name? Or a few, I think. Okay, well the interesting thing, if I ran this query just the way it is, you get no results. Okay, then because this is upper lower case, right? Yeah, yeah. And you'll know some names will be lower case again. So I use this little flag, the I flag at the end to say case independent, right? And all of a sudden there are the two of them. Yeah. North Acton and St. Paul's. Cool. Right? Because North N Acton N, right? Yeah. All right, so that's another example. And then uh, so you know you can go wild with regular expressions. Yeah. You know? So um quick question here. I mean, is there any use of like the like clause now after regular expressions? Yeah, that's a good question because the like clause, as you know, is pretty limited, right? Yeah. Um, the only thing is that regular expressions don't use indexes. So it's possible to use an index with a like expression. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you had an index on the last name. And if you said, go find names like, quote, G, and then use a percent sign, what will happen is we can scan the index and look for G is the part of the index, the first part of the index expression. So anything that prefixes, or prefix, right, the search, we can use the index. If it isn't starting at the beginning, then we just scan, right? So regular expressions uh, won't use the index. Okay. So again, that's that's something you may want to look at if you are doing scans against indexed columns. Otherwise, uh, you know, regular expression is very powerful. Yeah, right? seems like that. Yeah. Okay, statistics. Uh, all of the statistics that are new in this release, most of them are sampling functions. So I'm going to show you a couple of them. We'll go through them relatively quickly. But we already have variants, and covariants, and all of this stuff in DDT. Sampling, what that allows an analyst to do is say, all right, I know what the variance is, covariance. I want to inject a new value and see what happens to the variance. So you already know, let's say for the, let's say the employee table, the example here is, Salary and bonus, what's the covariance in the employees, right, based on these values? Well, I can now sample by saying, let's inject a new value, right, and let's see what happens to our covariance, rather than actually uh, manipulating the base data. Okay, so we got a couple of those. So you can do covariance sampling. Uh, median is, a, you know, one of the standard functions, right? Median, mode, and what's the other one? Mean, mean right. Standard deviation sampling. Uh, variance sampling, again, we're just doing variance, adding a new value to see what happens. Cumulative distribution, right, again, based on some new rows that I insert, right, or values that I insert. Uh, percentage rank within a group. So if you want to rank, right, uh, results. Percentiles, we have percentile calculations within a group using either discrete or continuous percentiles. See, mathematicians out there are going to love this, all right? Most of us will stand back and say, why am I ever going to use this stuff? But anyway, it's, you know, it's, it's important to somebody, okay? That's why it's there. Yeah. Okay. I like this one, with bucket. Um, the way this works is you tell DB2, uh, it's really for histograms, right? And basically what you tell DB2 is, I want you to create a number of equal size buckets, and then I want you to place the results into these buckets based on the value. So the example I have here, it says, look at the employee salaries, and I want you to slot employees by the salary that they have. And the way I'm going to slot these employees 
is that the minimum salary, so bucket number zero, if you want to call it that, is anything less than 35000 The last bucket, number 13 or whatever, is going to be anybody who makes more than 100000 and then the remainder, I'm going to split between 35000 and 100000 We're going to create another 11 buckets in between. So a total of 13. So that's what that 13 is. One on the bottom, one on the top, and the rest is split across 35000 in equal chunks. Right? Yeah. And then results will come back and tell you what bucket that salary was supposed to go in. And then you can do a histogram or a graph showing the distribution. Right? So it's a really neat function to use uh, for, like I said, for statistics and for graphing of, of values. Right? Definitely. Are you going to run out and use it? No, I don't think so. Right? Okay, whatever. <laughs> I, I thought it was neat. Okay. Okay, some other miscellaneous SQL. Uh, the plus sign for outer join. You know that's, that's an Oracle compatibility feature, right? That's it. Yeah. yeah, and you used to have to turn it on in DBT. Now it's default. It's turned on all the time. Uh, there's billions of SQL out there that use the plus sign in Oracle for, for outer join. So we just made it, you know, turned on by default. Uh, a couple of things with SQL compatibility. If you use any of our OLAP functions that do things like, um, you know, calculation over ranges, we've now added some some um, additions to that for things like distinct over aggregations, percentage rank of values coming back from the OLAP function. It's just again more value, right, in terms of what I can return from a SQL statement. Right. Be trim. This is again just a. Um, I mean, we have trim today, yeah, right? Our, our so, trim yeah, our trim, all L trim and yeah. trim and yeah. B trim is just another syntax, the same as you know other systems use B trim. Collation key, that's kind of neat. Um, this is if you want to sort your data on a different code page. Oh, okay. So you may have created a code page in a certain language, and what you can say is, I want you to order by collation key. Give me the column and what code page you want to use for the sorting. So this example says, let's let's sort the data in German code page. Right? So you make it a good different sort than you would with traditional sorting. Right? Yeah. Data slice ID, that's just for people who want to know what partition the results came from. If you have a DPF, you know, partition, it'll say it came from partition one or partition two or whatever. Right? Right. Uh, what, somebody asked me, like, what do you use that for? I said, well, for instance, let's say you do a, a select statement and you want to know what does uh, node number one have in it. So you can just say, say select, select where data slice ID for one. Right, so it'll only return results from that machine, right? So I, I have no clue why you want to do this. <laughs> you know, it's, it basically gives you some diagnostics of where the rows are sitting in your cluster. Right? Yeah. Um, lots of new, um, you know, and or not functions. These are for for integer values. Okay, so there the n in all of these names. So it says int n and and int n or. That basically means you're going to use either two byte, four byte, or eight byte integers when you do these calculations. Okay, so that's, these names are generic, but you'll have, for instance, if you want to do an XOR across two small ints, it's got to be int 2 XOR. Okay? Right. So this, there's a bunch of these functions. And there's the list. All right, so people can see them, run out and do them. Uh, some new hashing functions. Um, there's three of them, actually. There's hash, there's hash 4, and there's hash 8. Okay. okay. So everything you need to know about them is that they hash, right? Um, basically, hash four is four bytes, yeah. and you know that if you have many, many values, you can get collisions if your hash isn't big enough, right? So hash eight is eight bytes, and hash can be up to sixty-four bytes. So that's a huge hash, right? What do you use these for? Well, a couple things. One is I can use it in DPF. Remember last week we said uh, um, distribute by random. Yeah, remember? Yeah, we need to yeah. About, uh, that was a whole week ago. I know it was a, two, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, yeah. Uh, well, we can generate hash this way, hash function, right? Okay. Uh, the other reason for using it is um, you can almost use like a checksum. So if you've got a document that comes in, you can do a hash function against it and then store that in a database. And when you send it somewhere, you can check the hash on the other side to make sure they're the same, right? Um, the big hash function, I'm speculating it's for things like blockchains. You know, when you need to hash these uh, large values, and check to make sure that they're unique, right? Yeah. Um, so again, these are just new functions that you could use as part of your SQL. Two hex basically convert something from hex representation to a numeric representation, or vice versa. So that's raw to hex, right? The other way around. Again, just functions for manipulating uh, hex values. And then finally, Netiza, right? So if anybody out there is running a PDA device, a TISA device, 
this allows you to migrate some of that SQL without having to rework the code. So basically, we've got something called a SQL compact global variable. It's actually a, a statement level, right? So I can say in my SQL while I'm running, I can say set SQL compact equal to NPS, and that means Natiza, right? Or you can say DB2, or you can say just say null, right? And that will change the behavior of DB2. And so there's a couple of things that happen. Um, we change the compatibility so that we, we understand double dot notation a little bit different with Natiza. It's basically schema dot object as opposed to double dot. You remember what double dot was used for? Yeah. yeah. It was object relational. Yes. Which, you know, I don't know where that's going. But uh, translate function. Yes. Right? Which has different ordering of arguments. Uh, the NPS symbol so that the caret symbol becomes a power, like 2 to the power 5 would be 2 caret 5, right? Uh, grouping for select is kind of neat. I like this one so that I don't have to know the column name. I can just say group by the order of the column that's in the select list. And then finally, if you've written something in a TISA PL SQL, which is actually based on Postgres SQL, it can now be stored in DB2. So what we actually do is we convert it under the covers to SQL PL. Right. So again, that means somebody who's got a bunch of these Natiza um, stored procedures can run them in DB2. So here's some examples of these things that people care about. Uh, double dot, right, for NPS. Um, grouping. This one I like, actually. Um, I would use this one because, you know, then I don't have to remember the name of the columns, right? Especially when you get very complex SQL. So you notice the first example says select column as A, C2 plus C3 as B, so that's a calculation. And I want to group those. But you notice I can't use the word A for the select Right? I can't use the, the, like, you know, C1 as A, right? A is a rename. I can't use it. I have to say C1. And the calculation, I can't use the B as a calculation rename. I have to actually explicitly say C2 plus C3, mm -hmm. which to me is kind of stupid. But anyway, you notice if I turn on the PISA mode, it allows me to say group by 1 and 2. So that's the ordinal location of the uh, column. That's a hell of a lot easier to decode than it is the other way, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I find this true for, like, even... Um, Programs that generate SQL, it makes it a lot easier for them, right? You know, it, it, we're less error prone too, right? By doing it this way. So this is what happens when you turn on NPS mode. So, so, so it's a, a quick question on this. I mean, do we can we use uh, the Netiza extensions, the SQL extensions, if we don't use Netiza? Sure, why not? I mean, there's no, no we, we can use it. It's just that you have to remember that some of the special characters change, right? But one thing about Netiza mode, it's very simple to turn on and off because it's done at a statement level. So that means like if you're using SQL, what you could do just before you do any of these commands, you can say set SQL compat equal to you know, NPS, and then all the SQL I'm running after that point is running in compatibility mode, and then I can turn it back, SQL that's equal DB2, and it's like, it takes a nanosecond to do. So it isn't based on your application or the database or anything else, it's just during your session, right? Um, okay. okay. So, so there's no adverse effects? No, not really, because we don't change the data. We just It's just how we handle your SQL. In fact, even if you say you create a store procedure, procedure using regular, regular DB2 SQL, SQL it, it won't have won't a problem, have a right? In most cases, we figure it out based on the syntax of your store procedure, right? But just to be safe, if you are going to try some of these Postgres store procedures, then you should turn on this mode just to make sure that we're doing it properly. Okay, so there you can see it just says that basically if you're going to do a SQL PL, uh, you know, we're going to convert it to, to SQL PL for you with a SQL store procedure. Right. Okay. Okay, there's some limitations on it. Um, you can see the list here, but again, this is only important for people who are actually running Netiza right now, right? Um, so things like variable number of parameters, we can't do that. Um, non integer values, there's some, some slight restrictions on there. But uh, some, some people, people actually said, well, I'm going to have to look up what Postgres SQL allows me to do for store procedures. Because in theory, that's what the uh, store procedures are built for. So that may that give you some more flexibility. Who knows, right? Right. Um, OK, so that, believe it or not, is all the SQL that's, wow. that's coming. So there's a ton of stuff in there. There's quite right? a lot of stuff. Some of it's actually maybe even useful, right? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> to someone, yeah, to someone. I mean, I think there's a. It seems like, you know, it's SQL for you, isn't it? I mean, not all SQL is useful for everyone. Right. So, I mean, so we looked at so many SQL features uh, in today's sort of session. Are these available across all editions? 
Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if the customer is trying this out in, let's say, um, a community edition, right? Express C or Workgroup or Enterprise, it's, it, this works across all of them. So there are no restrictions on the use of these. Um, and like I said, in the teasers, you know, we don't care what you're running on, right? right. Um, so yeah, anybody's free to use these. By the way, I have a program called uh, DB2 Demo, which demonstrates a lot of this stuff. I was, yeah. I was, you know, this was my last question. Oh, to you. Okay. I, I, I'll, save, I'll save you for the last question, but right. you know, since yeah. you mentioned it, yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, uh, for folks who are listening to this, and uh, uh, you know, folks will who will hear this. I mean, George has been the architect of this fantastic uh, program application called DB2 Demo, which uh, has been there since which version? Uh, version two, probably. Version two, yeah. and, and what he does there is that you know he puts in examples, uh, you know, of, of new SQL or features, and you know, which you can actually look at, which you can demo, which you can uh, take the syntax of. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating uh, piece of uh, sort of application. I was going to just going to ask him whether he's going to update that for DB2.11. Yeah, it's actually in the process of doing that right now. Okay. So I'm hoping within the next week or so I'll publish it. Fantastic. You know, I'll send you a copy and you can put it up on your site as well for people to play with. Okay. You know, the only couple of requirements, one is it runs on Windows, right? So you need a stable Windows system. Um, and it needs access to DB2, whether you get a community edition locally installed on your, ser on your own machine, or you have a server somewhere. I don't care what it is. Linux, AIX, you know, as long as it's a DB2, I connect to it and I use it as a sample database for uh, trying so out examples. You have a test of what, what, what kind of things we can try on that for DB2.11. For DB2.11? Well, um, any of the SQL you've seen here will run on it. So the examples I have of all of the data types, the new uh, functions, right? So you'll see all the functions of all of the different things. But on top of that, it also lets you explore stuff in previous releases, for instance, JSON. Right, yeah. so you can run JSON out of it. Um, you know, any of the old SQL, um, PL SQL, SQL PL compatibility features, time travel query, yeah. RCAC, um, even got examples of um, stuff like um, anything in blue there. Blue, yes, yeah. Now the thing there is, you need to have a system that supports blue. Yes. Right? Yes, so you know, you're gonna have to have a copy of advanced edition to do the blue stuff. But yeah, columnar is in there. Right. Right. So we can show organize by column and and uh, show the results of that. Problem is my systems are fairly small, so performance is kind of hard to demonstrate when your machine is already running fairly quickly. Right? Yeah. Well, it's more of a functionality yeah. testing, isn't it, than, than really performance, the DB2 demo right. kind of. Yeah. In fact, thing. I even show simulated snap, you know, the um, not snapshots, but um, shadow tables. Right. Actually, the thing has it shows you how you can set shadow tables manually. Right. Right. Which right. Which is kind of kind of neat. But uh, yeah, it's all there just to show all the different types okay. of SQL that you. And you know, it's interactive too, right? Because people can try the queries, they can override them, change the syntax, run it, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's not. Um, so they can customize the yeah, queries. Sure. And everything. Yeah, I'd say it's it's a great tool. So I'm 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 really pleased that you have, you know, you you know, it's not it's not left in the, you know, in the attic somewhere or yeah, whatever. No, and, no, uh, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, it's it's being developed. So that's good news. Um. So let me put you on the spot here and ask you. Um, Couple of questions, okay? Uh, you know, every release we've been saying here from nine onwards, you know, there's always this Oracle compatibility stuff and everything, and, yeah. and every, you know, there's more and more and more. I mean, are we going to ever end this, or uh, you know, why all these compatibility yeah. things? Is there some, any other way in which we can handle this? Because we keep on saying 99% or 95%, right. or, and then 99 percent compatibility, and are we? When are we going to be there? Uh, when we're going to be there, well, I mean, everybody keeps adding new SQL, right? So if they could just stop adding new SQL features, we'd be done. But the issue is, there's a couple. If I was a, um, I was part of the SQL uh, council, they hate this stuff, right? right? Because a lot of the SQL is non-standard non SQL. And they say, why are you doing that? Well, the thing is that a lot of the SQL becomes popular when it gets out into the mainstream and people start using it and becomes de facto SQL. Okay, so an example would be the Oracle Plus site. That's a de facto SQL. It's not part of any standard. It's not part of you know ANSI, you know ninety two two thousand and eight whatever. It doesn't matter. You'll never find it in a, in a standards manual. But there are billions of lines of SQL written that use that. So when people start you know moving over to DB two and doing stuff, they'll say, uh, do I have to do the left outer join table on column equals column <laughs> rather than just you know a dot b equals b dot c out you know plus sign right? Yeah. You know there it is. It's done. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, you know, so some of this is, um, you know, syntax because it's become popular. Some of it's because when people move over, I don't want them to have to do a lot of editing with their SQL. You know, so the example would be in 2, in 4, in 8, like, so what? How hard is it for me to 
apparently very difficult now anyways to, <laughs> to, to allow synonyms, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, char 255, that's so that even DB2 for ZOS is compatible with us, right? Because we're there 255 or 254. Silly things like that, right? Right. But, you know, we're going to continue adding stuff because uh, people find some of the other databases and features to be convenient. And we don't want that to become an impediment, you know, to adopting DB2. So, 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 so these new features which are being added to DB2 are compatible with the new releases of authentication? Yes, in many Oracle, cases, Oracle, yeah. Oracle, Oracle, yeah. Postgres, right? Postgres well, you know, yeah. the create table like, you know, is yeah. another example. Um, you know, we've got a ton of things still on our list of what people want, but it's it's getting there, right? We're starting to get into more esoteric ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, fair enough. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, from all the SQL that you've shown us today, what do you think is the most valuable SQL in this release, which, which people, people should probably, you know, you know listeners, listeners should be, or sort of customers should be, you know, leveraging and, and looking at, what, you know, what, 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 what does it for you? Um, I tell you, the, the one, one that I like is the create table as select statement and right. being able to populate at the same time. Yeah. Uh, you don't know how much work that eliminates from a lot of scripts. Right. A lot of my scripts, so I'm getting some subsets of data and I'm doing something with it. And you, know, so you, you remove them a number of steps, right? Yeah. Um, so that to so that's me kind of is kind of important. important. The second, second one, one is the, um, the regular expressions are going to be very, very uh, useful, especially when I start scanning for things like addresses and you know larger sets of text. Right? Now, a warning, because I'm not using indexes, you better be fairly specific on the other predicates. You know, So if I'm saying I want to find somebody within a postcode, for instance, is a great string to use for an index, right? Um, but you know, if I got a postcode, at least I can narrow it down to maybe a couple hundred physical addresses, right? You know, if I can't, then I'm not scanning everything. So that's just something people need to be aware of, right? Oh, okay. No, no, okay, fair enough. Um, I, so, so I think with this, uh, we'll, you know, this brings us really to the end of today's uh, seminar and to the whole uh, series here at four webinars. Uh, for those who have been following, uh, we have recordings of each of these sessions. Uh, you know, they are available for you. If you, if you just go to uh, the, the Triton's website, you'll find links to each of these recordings. Um, there is really, uh, I just want to emphasize that DB211, as we have probably heard, uh, as we have heard during these four sessions, is really a great release. There's lots of neat stuff there. Uh, and, and you know, the biggest incentive really for those folks of you who are on 9.7 and 10.1, especially 9.7, okay, it's a one-step migration. It's a one-step upgrade from 9.7 to 11.1. And uh, as, as George told us uh, three weeks ago, uh, 9.7 and 10.11 are getting out of support next year. So it's time to start planning. It's time to, you know, uh, think of your uh, upgrade, uh, uh, you know, time scales. Uh, to 11, and there's, you know, as we said, lots of good stuff, lots of features on DB2 Blue, uh, lots of uh, enhancements in pure scale, SQL, there's lots of stuff for everybody there. So hopefully, uh, you'll be you know, looking at this, uh, moving to DB2 11 one. And Yeah, and the other thing is, people should know that a lot of this stuff has been working in our cloud version of DB2, exactly. right, for a while now. Yeah. So it's a very stable release at this point in yeah. time. But those people who might wait till the first fix pack, uh, probably third quarter, right? Yeah. And and then you'll be happy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's a good point yeah, you make. Yeah. I, I think this is the first release, and I, yeah. I think I mentioned this, you know, a few weeks ago. This is the first release where there are all these features we've been talking about have been out there for at least nine months, uh, and people have been trying them. Uh, you know, the development team has been, you know, looking at issues, if any, on on those things, and then and, 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 you know, uh, refreshing the images on on, on Dash TV. Uh, so that they can be used. So, uh, you know, in terms of stability, you know, you know, I think there's lots to say, hopefully, yeah. about this uh, this release. So, so go out there, try it, and uh, hopefully, upgrade. You know, and I want to end uh, the the session today by saying a big thank you to uh, George. Uh, it's very nice, nice of him to be able to help us and to you know spread the word for DB211. And uh, hopefully, George will see you again for some subsequent webinars. Yeah, absolutely, and thank you for inviting me and for arranging all this. And uh, I guess we're miss missing Julian today. I want to thank him as well for uh, sure. organizing a lot of this stuff. So thank you, everybody, too, for listening. And uh, if you do have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me right now. 
and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. And um, also, you, you should, should look, look forward, forward to the uh, uh, PB2 demo when I have a chance to get that. Yeah, so, so as soon as I get that, we'll, we'll you know, if you put it on our website, website I'll, I'll, I'll probably, you know, we'll, I'll probably tweet about it. So watch out for that from PB2 Geek or Triton One or myself, and you can download it from our website. No problems. You tweet, do you? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to convert George to Twitter. Yes. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Okay. Take care. Bye.